the, pl the first plenary session. Quite obviously, I am not Mampella Rampelli, my dear friend and co-president of the Club of Rome, who uh, I explained yesterday, uh, and I bring her uh, apologize for not being able to be with us. I am Carlos Alvarez Pereira, a uh, treasurer and member of the executive committee of the Club of Rome, so I will not replace her because this is mission impossible. I will do my best to share this session and I will also speak, but not first. I mean, um, I don't want to use the privilege of uh, being the chairman and, and speak first. I'm following actually Mampela's wisdom. She says, you know, we have one mouth and two ears, so it's more important to listen than to talk. And especially when I come, when I go to a, to a place which is different from mine, and this is not my first time in, in Serbia and in Belgrade, but anywhere, anytime I go somewhere else, I try to listen first. And we have, I have with me in this panel very distinguished speakers. So let's start by listening to Mrs. Ivanka Popovic, a rector of uh, Universitat Biogradu, dear uh, Ms. Popovic, thank you. you have, the floor is yours. Good morning to all. Dear representatives of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences and dear dignitaries of the Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences and uh, esteemed participants of this, I think, highly interesting meeting. It's my great pleasure and honor to be able to address you with maybe a few thoughts about higher education, but education in general, where I think these first sessions will open up the topic because I think no one can, in, within 10 minutes, give any substantial contribution. So, but I would like to share a few thoughts. And for those of you who, who are in Serbia for the first time and maybe do not know enough about the University of Belgrade, perhaps I can give you a very brief snapshot of our university. It's the oldest university in Serbia. We have about 100,000 students studying in many disciplines. Uh, we are a comprehensive research intensive university. That is actually about 60% of the scientific output of Serbia is from uh, faculties and institutes of the University of Belgrade. So therefore, research excellence is incredibly important to us and there are several areas in which we excel. But I have to say that about almost half of our students are studying social sciences and humanities. And the contributions of social sciences and humanities unfortunately cannot be so easily quantified as those in natural sciences and engineering and medical sciences. So therefore, the, the strength of social sciences and humanities at our university, uh, I cannot present in such a way, but I believe that not only at my university, but at all universities, this uh, increasing gap between technological and social development will be overcome by representatives of social sciences and humanities, and that's why I see their role as being crucial in the future of all aspects of education and the development of society. I would like to dwell on one point, and that is how well we use the money for higher education here in Serbia. This is, uh, you, some of you are maybe familiar with the Universitas 21 rankings, which do various analyses. One is taking the scientific output of a country and uh, actually setting it to its GDP. And in this respect, Serbia is actually an excellent performer. And I would not like to say that th that means we can do good science with little money. I'm just saying that we're very, very frugal with the money we get. So I'm taking the prime minister at her word that education will be at the forefront of the Serbian government and therefore I hope also the budget of the Republic of Serbia. So uh, moving on to, I would like to present four ideas that I think may have had a key impact on higher education. Of course, higher education can be only as good as the education that comes before. 
So the focus on primary and secondary education is really extremely important. And we are seeing some problems with the freshmen coming into universities that their knowledge is maybe not what it should be. So reforms at lower levels of education are crucial for higher education to perform in a better way. So if we go back a little bit, I think uh, at least in Europe, the Humboldtian concept of university is the one that has had the longest lifespan and that only lately are we seeing some changes in how higher education can be perceived. But I think we can't knock von Humboldt in the 21st century, considering that this type of university will provide skills for a profession, but it provides people who can think and who can solve problems. And therefore, maybe what I am a supporter of is maybe Humboldt University 4.0, adapted to the 21st century and not forgetting, because now I think we see higher education moving into a rather gray zone where it's difficult to distinguish between academic and vocational training. Uh, training for certain skills is excellent, it's fine, but it might be short-sighted for some of the skills that are being uh, addressed. And that's why I think von Humboldt was on the right track and that we need to adapt what's going on. Now, when we talk about this blurring of lines, uh, we especially see a tremendous focus of many governments on applied sciences, that this is the key. And I won't talk about innovation ecosystems because I think you're all fed up with talking about innovation systems, ecosystems. The point is uh, there is only good science. Whether this science can be applied or not remains to be seen. And at universities, we need to do good science, and certain aspects of this science can be taken to other levels, and if so, that's excellent. But we mustn't separate the two, and I'm also hoping at least that the new budget for research in Europe, Horizon Europe, will try to keep this distinction. Now, moving along, I, okay, maybe we'll get a little bit dark, but I have to mention Huxley and others who are seeing various visions of a society that is moving in the wrong direction on a global level. So are new technologies making us lazy? Where are we using our brains enough? I think this is a very big challenge to educators because we need to interest our students but a typical lecture by a traditional professor is not the way to reach this audience. In the other, on the other hand, can our audience, who is used to other forms of communication, able to follow us? And this is what I find extremely disturbing. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have read the various studies uh, with various uh, instrumental techniques showing how the brain responds to certain types of information. We need people who can do, quote, deep thinking. Uh, scanning enormous amounts of information is very useful. It's a useful skill. Our uh, youth is very capable of doing this, but that means their brain is being trained in a different way, and we need to pull them in to the deep thinking. And that's why universities are so important. That's why a Humboldt-type university is extremely important to train people not to lose the ability of deep thought. It means having a retention time. It's mean being able to focus for a longer period of time that's longer than a tweet or a, a very, when, when I look at various articles on the internet today, what you see, what is the information? What is the key information you get? You get the title, the name of the author, the date, and then in parentheses it says reading time, one minute, three minutes, five minutes. I think that is something that's unacceptable that you decide whether you're going to read an article depending on how much of its time, or your time it's going to take up. So we are faced with some really serious challenges 
in all forms of education, but I think higher education may be at the moment in the biggest challenge because we are, have people who are arriving already shaped by certain aspects of the digital. And uh, how are we going to overcome this problem? Obviously, traditional universities are not the answer. Institutions, especially if they're large, are very inert. They're very difficult to move ahead. And that's why smaller, younger universities can answer the challenge more quickly. But does that mean it's better? And uh, that's why we mustn't give up on the traditional universities. And I think one common point that most universities are uh, now trying to st struggle with, this is of the transition. And many people have mentioned transition today since the start of this meeting. But what I find interesting is it's talking about from changing one state or condition to another. And of course, in natural sciences, this is OK, because we know what state one is and state two is. We now don't really know what the next stage or condition will be. So we are transitioning into the unknown. And in this respect, it requires a foresight that maybe it is not easy to have, which means we have to go back to generics. We have to go to basic knowledge to enable people to be adaptable to what will come to the future. And that's why I see that universities, having gone through this dilemma of how to define what transition will be, are going for the sustainable development goals. Why is this so interesting? It's interesting because we are going toward interdisciplinarity. We are going to problem-based solving uh, uh, let's say, a problem-based uh, approach to learning. And this could be a way where we could overcome several issues. One is to transform teaching into an active mode. And the second one is to reestablish the connection between universities and the societies in which they operate. Because we all know that the ivory tire is a thing of the past, although some academicians and, and, and university professors are still stuck in them. But this is a way of interacting directly, whether in your own community or at a global level. So if we look at other aspects of how are we going to adapt this new type of higher education, we have to look at the job market. And many have said there will be jobs that will be disappearing. And this is true. There will be, this is one of many articles which discusses this point. But what you can see is that we are losing mostly menial jobs. That means we're going to have people who are insufficiently, I'm finishing, educated, not being to able to move forward. Uh, the traditional professions are there. They are stable. And this is where the focal point of university is. And as far as the new emerging careers are, this is where we are seeing pockets of adapting on, the, uh, on part of the universities. So we need to make some very serious steps forward and to address the biggest skill gaps. The biggest skill gaps are actually in the area of what I mentioned, social sciences and humanities. These are people skills that we are lacking. And this is not really that you can put into a direct curriculum. On the other hand, we have some IT, very broadly defined IT skills, which can be addressed through formal, informal, or non-formal education. And of these biggest skills, only the one dealing with management is, has maybe to do with the potential academic training. So this is where uni universities need to fill in this gap. So when I say I see various problems as I finish, I've spoken about too many problems. But on the other hand, universities, I think, are the only solution to maintain humaneness in a, in a society that is developing too quickly in a harsh and cold way. Even though there will be uh, the forming of more and more elite institutions, uh, even though we have a more complex situation regarding our students, regarding um, their backgrounds, whether they are mature students, whether they are coming from um, backgrounds that have not given them the tools 
to be successful in higher education, we will obviously have only the universities, not the vocational schools, which are fine and dandy, but the universities are the institutions that will save humanity from itself, I think, in the future to come. And therefore, all the contributions coming today uh, and tomorrow at this meeting are really, really crucial that we can share this knowledge and make higher education better. So I thank you for attention, and I'm sorry if I spoke too long. Thank you very much, Mrs. Popovic. You didn't speak too long, and what you said was extremely interesting, and I appreciate it, especially the part on these reflections on our relationship to technology. I will go back to that myself later. So I think we have time for maybe one short question. The term short question meaning not an exposition of your own statement uh, longer than three minutes and then a question. The short question is a short question. So do we have a mic for uh, Mariana? I see there are several hands, but we have only time for... The role of formal degrees. Yeah. Uh, at the bachelor level, I think they're essential. If you take it to a higher level where we're going into interdisciplinarity, there I think we can be more flexible. But you cannot have an interdisciplinary team without people who have knowledge of the fundamentals. Because every, if everyone is doing a little bit of everything, we are going to be missing parts of uh, knowledge. And this is very, very risky because every interdisciplinary curriculum provides many opportunities of choice, which means it provides many holes. And that's why I believe firmly that black bachelor curricula are essential as a building block for what comes later. So yes, the bachelor degrees, yes, for later, I think we can be flexible. Very good, thank you. I know, I, I assume uh, you don't make friends by chairing sessions. <laughs> so yeah, I see hands and uh, people willing to ask, but sorry, I am the timekeeper. I, I will not make friends with my colleagues in the panel, nor with you, but that's what uh, the role I had to assume. Let's go on with, I'm sure it will be also very interesting with uh, Mr. Kaha Shengelia president of the Caucasus University in Tbilisi, Georgia, and also president of the International Association of University Presidents. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it, was, it is my honor and pleasure and to be here in Belgrade. Um, last time I was here, actually, was um, actually first country uh, in my life, when I visited uh, for, uh, out of my country, which was in 1991, I've been so far 172, but first one was Serbia, and I'm very proud of it. Because um, we Georgians are very close to Serbia and very close to Serbians, historically, culturally, mentally, psychically, everything is, when I'm coming to Belgrade, I think I'm in my own Tbilisi. And thank you very much for it. So, um, now, um, I have quite challenging job to, to say what I was thinking of, and I was, when Gary asked me to, to do it, and, uh, and Boja asked me to do it with presentation, it was very, not easy task, and um, good, good thing was I had a time to think about it, and, and then finally I got something which I would like to present today to you. As I already mentioned, um, ideas and studies about higher education trends and problems are highly fragmented. Higher education is a different age, a different continent. Change is on the way, and a lot of this will affect academic profession. There is a continued need to reestablish a sense of academic mission. The academic revolution which took place in higher education during last century varied in trans transformation, comprehending this task, while bank and development cycle, is not an easy job. We know that last developments and challenges are not less of importance since the arrival of research universities in the 19th century, 
as a new university national globally. To drive up change and nurture up challenges for 21st century, higher education is more extensive and wider due to number of institutions and people by effect. Among our issues, I would like to draw your attention to some of the main challenges, like educational massification and social mobility, funding of higher education, diversified higher education systems and con uh, confronted ac academic standards. Initially, leading goal of higher education was a cope with public service mission. In 21st century, higher education has become a competitive enterprise. For student population, places at university are scarce. Admission process is competitive and universities contest for status, rankings, and funding from private and public sources. While competition is always a force to support fair development and excellence, it has not always supported academic society in development. For 21st century higher education, globalization, and integrated world economy is a key reality. Main influencing factors here are information and communication technologies, international knowledge network, and the role of English as dominant scientific language among our issues. All these result a variety of policies and program what universities create in response to internalization. A such trend is that some regions or world represent an assault to national culture and autonomy. International unequal distribution of wealth and regional inequalities are some of the key challenges for different groups for access to higher education. Another big challenge is academic profession. In 21st century, an academic profession is under stress as never before, as there is an increasing need to respond to massification. Average qualification of academics in many countries has declined. As always, research resources are to be managed better. Research, teaching, and public service is in tight competition again. Information technology and technological revolution once was considered to take a leading role, but it is not happening anytime soon. All academic institutions are required to follow new technological developments as both faculty and students like to demand digitized processes. Electronic means and digitalization of resources help academic process and research collaboration, knowledge transfer, and availability at remote places. Crisis of academic profession is present and vivid. Universities cannot achieve results without well-qualified, committed academic staff. Neither an impressive campus nor an innovative curriculum will produce good results without a good professors. There's a lack of quality academic professions globally. With some predictions, up to half of universities, professors worldwide just hold bachelor degrees. In addition, to this part-time profession become another challenge. Good professors need to be truly involved both in teaching and research. A significant proportion of academic profession must have full-time academic appointments and devote full attention exclusively to academic responsibilities. Current challenges is that universities employ part-time professors who have full-time commitments in our institutions. It is no longer easy and possible to lure best minds in academia. This uh, significant part of the problem is financial. Academic salaries did not keep up with rem remuneration of highly trained professionals anywhere. In the past years, academic autonomy was one of the main sources of affection to this profession. Situation has changed in many academic systems and institutions. In terms of ac accountability and assessment, academic profession has lost much of its autonomy. As a result, international mobility is increasing for academics similar to students. High, higher education continues to be defined 
as it has always been. By who enrolls, who teaches, how knowledge is produced and disseminated, and by higher education's societal role. Change is inevitable in time, but line of movement in a modern world seems to be accelerating and presenting higher education to more complex challenge in every era. Traditional societal mission of higher education has been under pressure. The commercialization of higher education has put considerable strain on its social mission. These challenges require policymakers, administrators, and professors to reconsider some of the main structure and traditions of academic profession. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Professor Shengelia, for your realistic, I would say, critical but realistic appraisal of, of the challenges of higher education. It's, it's good to hear, you know, declarations, I mean, uh, statements which go beyond the banalities of uh, talking about, about education, but uh, pointing to the, the stresses. So many thanks for that, and many thanks for something absolutely incredible which you made happen which is uh, you are the first person ever I ever met which spent less time <laughs> than, assigned, than assigned to speak. This is the first in my professional life. So thank you also for that. <laughs> that gives us a little bit more of room for questions. So in particular for the questions, Marcel, the end of the room, please. <clears throat> Closer, no, just closer to you, to your mouth, I think. Ah, okay. Also, we can speak up, no problem, we can hear you.
Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. Good, qu good questions. Not, not completely easy to respond, right? Completely. It's as I, as my was speech. I, I'm, I'm trying to answer him in two seconds. Um, <laughs> Because, oh because we're a new generation, don't want to waste time for just one speaking, we have to do things. Uh, what we do in my university is, uh, it's, a, it's a very young university, around 20, 21 years old now. And many of you already been and they know how, actually how we are doing. 99% of my students, students, are employed already. Okay, good question, but we are also thinking about this, what's going to happen in 2024 or 2040, and we are trying to uh, introduce new uh, curriculum or new subjects, which is going to be in 2040. And we, we, are, we are now, we're not teaching anymore, believe me, we're not teaching anymore, <laughs> it may be not right to say, but philosophy or psychology anymore, we're doing something else now. Believe me, we don't. If, uh, we not. We not doing it right now. Philosophy is not my cup of tea now anymore. I'm sorry for philosophers, but this is the way we have to do it because we are very practical. Yes, please. Okay, okay I, I, I have. Oh, sorry, I have to uh, vehemently disagree with you. <laughs> I'm sorry because I think we need a balance of all professions, because especially philosophers. That I am. I'm an engineer, and I fully comprehend the need that philosophers are the ones who can work on bridging the gap and how we can cope with the technology we have created. So I think it's transdisciplinary, yes, that is the buzzword for the future, but this does not cut out knowledge. We can't take niches of knowledge as, we, as they suit us. There has to be a full body of knowledge from which we have people who can contribute. At, because everyone is working in teams now. Nobody works alone. What we need is a certain number of people with transdisciplinary capabilities of organizing research or any type of problem solving that we're talking about. But you cannot kill off standard professions uh, in this, for the sake of transdisciplinarity. We have to have a balance which will provide all the knowledge we need to move forward. Because if we're not careful, we can have a situation in 50 years where nobody will know what a certain term is in a certain field. Then we've not done the right thing. And just imagine, a, let's say, a, some f fluke, some power cut that will cut off our access to our databases, to Wikipedia and everything else, our students will be lost. We have to have some other element of training which goes to the fundamentals. So I think uh, you've opened up an incredibly important point of discussion, but I'm not sure that we can answer it quickly. And as far as the University of Belgrade goes, it's moving as fast as it can away from traditional uh, professions but it's a slow process because the resistance is tremendous and I think it will take time. But I believe it's happening. Thank you. So we will, we will take the question by Olivia now at the very end, but we will not answer it. We will keep it for later. But please, gi uh, let's, let's hear your question. You're, you're welcome. Maybe you can wait for the mic, uh, if the mic works. Yeah, the, the acoustic is very good here.
Very good question. Let's use that as the end of the, of the session because I think it, uh, I mean, we are all, uh, this, we are all concerned about that. <laughs> so now we have the, the pleasure of uh, listening to Professor Dragan Juricin from the Faculty of Economics here in the University of Belgrade. Professor Juricin, the, the floor is yours. You Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is, this I, I your, like is this your talk or, uh, for now, or is this another one? This is my presentation. Oh, okay, perfect, yes. perfect. Okay. This is my presentation. Uh, so uh, I, what I'm really trying to do is to relax this rigidity, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, practicing in this panel. Uh, I, 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 uh, my predecessor uh, saved me uh, three minutes and I will capitalize uh, this opportunity and I will expand my presentation from 12 to 15 minutes. So, uh, I, will, I will play the bad this guy, is don't balanced, worry. <laughs> This is balanced, balanced approach. Uh, so, after more than two and a half century of uh, industrialization and uh, more than uh, four decades of uh, neoliberalism experiment, the most contingent factors of the future of our planet are anthropogenic climate crisis and income concentration. This double trouble is a consequence of uh, wrong model of growth and related economic policy uh, platform. In a new millennium downing, the impact of global warming of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level is the greater challenge, maybe. It is the result of the planet Earth uh, layers disorder. According to John Forrester, the planet Earth itself is system dynamics, nexus of elements interconnected together by exchange relations or flows. Phys uh, physical system is closed, but not isolated. The conservation law is a way of functioning in it. Matter and energy can be destroyed, they can be transformed. Energy change is possible, a change of matter is negligible. There are amount of energy that can be transformed into disorder or pollution and dispersed heat is actually manifestation of pollution. In biosphere layer, the fundamental law of functioning is adaptive evolution. In economic system, uh, be, uh, which is the uh, man-made viability is measured by GDP growth rate. In conventional economic theory, sometimes called orthodox, independently from the school narratives, market is primarily coordination mechanism. Economic rules, primarily impacting the tax system and cost of capital. And these two variables are changeable, dependently of the power of stakeholders, primarily. Economists are the uh, toys in the hands of uh, politicians. The laws that govern the main processes in physical system, unfortunately, do not depend on economic schools narrative, as well as changing preferences of stakeholders and lobby groups. Today, there are deep fractures between the layers, vertical fractures, and inside the layers, horizontal fractures. In economic layer, the fracture is a consequence of long-term ignorance of negative external effects as a consequence of exponential growth based of industrialization. Particularly after the exponential growth, which means compound average growth rate more than 5%, the next stage is overshooting. Fractures in economic system and disorder, particularly dispersed heat, have penetrated deeper into the structure of system dynamics, threatening sustainability of other layers of the planet as whole. Also, climate crisis is macro-relevant factor. 
because we have a squeeze in the GDP level. Cautiousness about debt is raising, which means climate change will influence climate of change. Attribution studies based on global climate models identify the role of anthropogenic factors as primary driver of global warming in this century. Also, recent modeling of global warming based on artificial intelligence also confirms previous results. Framing decarbonization challenge requires halving process anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions uh, 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 squeezed in every decade. Almost all sectors need transformation part, particularly energy, agriculture, transport, construction, but then finance, because broadband is great consumers of electricity. Roadmap for halving anthropogenic emissions could help promotion of non-linear disruptive technological breakthroughs toward circular economy. Previous impacted new industrialization, A, and B, heterodox economic policy platform. Another indication of neoliberal model of capitalism fault line is income and wealth concentration. The term neoliberalism has been used to explain the trend in economics that followed the displacement of Keynesianism during 1970s with market fundamentalism and so-called Washington consensus economic policy platform. Washington-based institutional uh, support from IMF, World Bank, and U.S. Uh, Treasury Department suggested minimal reform package following principles of deregulation, liberalization, and privatization, particularly for Latin American countries in 1980s and for countries from Central and Eastern Europe during transition in 1990s. But in a, a home country, uh, neoliberalism produced plutonomy related to those who have extraordinary wealth. Manifestation of financial sector mentality for plutocrats is short-term orientation instead long-term growth and investment particularly in market instruments in their portfolio. The global level, on the global level, distribution of wealth looks like champagne glaze. Top 1% captured 27% of total growth, and 20% of riches participate in 83% of income. In the meantime, neoliberal model of growth get the alternative. Uh, in, in case of developing countries, uh, development based on technology transfer following the, the principle of manufacturing-led export growth and inflation tar targeting as universal and almost exclusive policy tool, uh, get macro deficit, increase that, re reducing of speed of growth and developing economy into the so-called middle income trap. To escape the trap, it is necessary to, to reduce foreign borrowing. This is not possible without reducing technology purchase from abroad. Search for solution inspired growth model in early 1960s, so-called Asian model, supported by some luminaries like Professor Roderick toward internal technology development supported by industrial policies. Previous was a seed of pro-growth state or managed capitalism in terms of Professor Rajan. The prosperity of any economy or business organization is contingent of compatibility of its structural variables and context variables. Actually, the new normal is double flying wheel with two key forces moving in different directions. The Great Recession of 2008 and 
consequences of so-called unconventional economic policies and industry for all. The situation is further complicated by the fact that other forces holistically impacted key forces of the new normal, particularly uh, demographics, uh, new cold war or geopolitics, uh, the global appeal toward the environmental conservation and uh, uh, unconventional uh, macroeconomic policies in the period after 2008. Uh, let me illustrate the coupling from the logic in the case of anti-recession measures based on simple examples, three simple examples. Uh, following too big to fail policy, central bank in a developed country after the 2008 crisis bailed out banks instead debtors. Second, ultra easy money in QE, quantitative easing, the coupled risk and reward relations. And third, negative interest rate, destroy time value of money concept. By destroying conventional cause result logic, unconventional economic policies have destroyed fundamentals of free market capitalism. Now we are in, in the brink of new era. Uh, this is the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, possibilities seems endless. We know that in so-called devolution of the industrial revolution, we see four uh, stages. Now we are in the fourth one uh, and uh, this is the era of endless possibilities, but endless threats. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, we have and see quantum leap of, of performance in output productivity, but also in population. Growth curve of population is exponential. From 1784, when Industrial Revolution uh, start until 2015, the human population skyrocketed from 0 0.8 billion to 7.4 billion. So we have a problem. We have too many people on the wrong side and not enough people on the right side. When it comes to paradigm, it is a time to expect inflection point. There are a reason, B, opportunity. Every science, no matter how serious it is, follows its paradigm as a set of rules with the power of, to explain behavior of the system under consideration. The new normal triggers paradigm change. Actually, this is a double paradigm change, paradigm change in microeconomics and micromanagement and paradigm change in macro management or economics. Economy can't do what the nature can do, but it must follow fundamental principle of physical system functioning reversibility one. So if we follow this principle, circular economy is a right choice. Another requirement depends on the complexity of the system in the time of Okay. in the time of fourth industrial uh, revolution. Due to universal connectivity, which is the new free good instead of uh, land, uh, water, uh, and air, the possible interconnections or flows grow with the square of the number of interested parties or nodes. As a consequence, the complexity of the business ecosystem grows faster than the ecosystem itself. Namely, ability to find, classify, aggregate, and transform transaction data and actionable information grow faster than that of using it. It means that noise will grow faster than the signal. The former easily drones the later. So, actionable information 
is the in the focus. Revolution starts in microeconomics with uh, so-called PDP loop, physical digi digital physical uh, loop, and continue in macroeconomics with new set of rules explained in so-called new model of circular economy, which uh, changed the linear model of production with principle of reversibility. New set of rules in economics are visible hand of the state is legitimate and complementary institutional choice and short-term budget balance should not be fetish and in connection uh, connecting different form of capital for sustainable inclusive growth there are double axis vertical for education and science and technology and horizontal for diffusion of uh, new innovations and results also in a term of policy platform we have the changes this is so-called heterodox model with industrial policies horizontal vertical and uh, automatic stabilizers uh, which harmonize uh, the, these policies to each other the role of education in this situation uh, is concentrated on modern career development, change field STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, change jobs, sustainable and inclusive, job and change direction, turning learning into returning. Many countries has the problem with brain drain because it's not easy to save the people in the same geography without reform the people will left the country by using ecological means thank you thank you thank you very much professor juricin so now i will switch directly to my own presentation sorry for that So, dear ladies and gentlemen, what else can be said? Take into account that I am the obstacle, the physical obstacle to your coffee break. <laughs> I, I want to share with you a philosophy, which is that life is about asking questions and obtaining responses which lead to new questions. And to start with, I would like you to look at a graph, and I will not say anything for some seconds, because I want you to look at this. What this graph says is that we have a real problem. Nobody has found the, the answer to the question of what sustainable development is. Countries with high level of human development as we measure it have high footprints. Countries with low footprints have low levels of human development. That's the main question for the future of not, of, not only of education, for the, the future of humanity itself. Not so much for the future of the planet, not so much for the future of life. They will survive without us for the future of humanity itself. Which leads me to another very, very simple question. A very intimate and absolutely universal question that so many millions of people are asking, so many millions of parents 
are asking. So this is about education, of course, but this is, goes much beyond education. And we have the paradox that in the countries which are, we still consider themselves as the center of the planetary system, this question is now asked more and more. Because people have the perception that the lives of their kids will be worse than their own. Many millions of people have that perception. Isn't that weird in the 21st century? So let me provoke you with some ideas. One is that it looks like we go at high speed, right? We go very fast. We have heard a lot about uh, the speed of technological innovation, the fourth industrial revolution coming, et cetera, et cetera. And it's true that there are many things which go very fast, but in some fundamental, really fundamental issues for the future of humanity, we are completely gridlocked, stuck in a place where we are not able to address the questions of climate change, loss of biodiversity, etc. Will technology solve it? Not by itself. Sometimes I've been 25 years an entrepreneur in the IT sector, and my conviction now is more than at the beginning that the framing of technological development is many times more aligned with the ideas that the idea that humans, we humans, have to serve technology. This is what I call the technolitarian scenario. It's more aligned with that than with the idea that technology has to serve not only humanity, but life at large. And speed, you know, beware of that criterion. As some wisdom coming from a completely different lens brought to us, you know? So a good question is, what do we not see? I think this is a fundamental kind of questions we have to ask. Because we have so much information, so much knowledge, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that we forget about our blind spots. And let me do a, a very simple experiment. If I draw this, this looks pretty natural, you know? If I start with the idea of us, myself, my family, my tribe, my country, us is a very natural concept to us. If I continue drawing and I add this, this continues to look quite natural, right? We see that all the time. We use the concept of environment, us and the environment. But the bias is already here. In this very simple scheme, we got it all wrong from that very beginning by saying there is us and there is the environment as separate things, as natural as that. So my friend, my dear friend Mariana Borgesan is worried about the uses of AI in the future and if AI can be made beneficial and, and you are right in being worried about that because the biases are so well ingrained in our way of thinking that we take for granted that us and the environment are different things and that they are separate and then we can put processes and the environment to, to exploit it for our needs, and then we also do this. We also put processes on other people. There is always a them. And of course, I mean, it's tricky to see how humans, we are so good at moving, drifting from the idea that I am different from you, distinction, to the idea of well, I don't care so much about you, separation, to the idea of I'm better than you, exclusion. Exclusion which leads to exploitation. And this is so much ingrained in our culture, in our modern culture, that we don't see it. We don't even see that. We don't even see that there are many layers of between reality our perceptions on reality, most of them being unconscious. We have built uh, the modern civilizations on the idea that we are able to capture the essence of reality through processes of conscious thinking. 
while most of the processes, most of the living processes are unconscious, including the billions of processes which keep us alive, you know. And then we skip the, I mean, this is not new. I'm not throwing here things which have not been elaborated by others, also by philosophers, sorry. And uh, that there is something between our conscious understanding and the perceptions which are frameworks of interpretation. So for instance, we have been taking for granted that we can separate reality from knowledge from action and actually we defined disciplines <clears throat> to talk about these three levels, you know. What is, and that we can separate them, that we can take a place which is from outside reality and we can acquire objective knowledge of reality and based on that knowledge we can elaborate and then we can elaborate separately what would be good or bad. And we defined roles for, or mediators, uh, the role of science mediating between what we say is reality, what it is, and epistemology, what do we understand, and the roles of technology and law and institutions, etc., mediating between what should be and what we know, you know. And of course, the role of education trying to um, get us into the knowledge of these disciplines. But there are plenty of blind spots in the, in the, in the gaps between uh, reality, knowledge, and action, and in the fact that we are part, we are not outside of the environment. And AI, just to brief point on this, AI is not solving this. AI, as it is today, maybe it can be reconceived in a different way, AI as it is today doesn't solve this, this issue, it just accelerates the issue. This is based also on the, on the idea, on the framework of mechanistic thinking, and the big, big paradox is that while physics has evolved over time since mechanistic thinking and, uh, and uh, the par that paradigm was developed in the 17th century until today, physics has developed many others, many other paradigms of science because that discipline has been able to realize, oh, uh, this paradigm of classical mechanics only explains a certain a certain area of phenomena, and we have many more which are not explained for that, by that, let's develop new paradigms. But we have not done that, or very marginally, as far as our social institutions are concerned, as far as our education is concerned, etc. And by the way, we forgot in the process, in the scheme I, I, I put before, we excluded areas of human experience which do not fit well in this rationalistic perspective of the world. And we put them, you know, into private spheres or in the sphere of entertainment. I'm talking about all kinds of spiritual traditions, all kinds of ancient knowledge, and for sure the role of art. Instead of understanding art as a different way to access reality, maybe a richer way because it involves a lot of our unconscious processes, we, we have converted art into yeah, a business, you know? Uh, Société du spectacle, that's entertainment. All of that is very much related with this idea that effects have causes and that if we want something to happen, we have to define a purpose, a conscious purpose, ten actions, and, and then we will get effects. But another, another good question is this one. What the dog will do? It comes from Gregory Bateson, who used this, the following metaphor to explain the difference between mechanistic thinking and living systems. If you kick a ball or a stone, you will be able to predict very precisely with the appropriate instruments of measure the trajectory of the ball. If you kick a dog, you cannot predict anything. She can run away, she can attack you, she can go around wondering why 
you attacked her. That's the domain of living systems. Living systems are not solutions to problems. Life has no problems. Uh, living systems are not answers to cause, effects, mechanisms. It's an infinite cycle of questions and responses with no end and no purpose other than life itself. And, and we have limited our consciousness, our conscious mind is limited to understand that. We can develop other ways to understand that, but a person who made a fundamental contribution to the history of, of science and knowledge, because he, he was probably the main character to reconcile thermodynamics with biology, said this, the world is richer than it is possible to express in any single language. So let's take care of that. Let's take care of the fact that we have to stop suffering from complexity and uncertainty. Yes, they are, they are here, of course. And, uh, and they are here to stay. And they were, they were always here. It's just our framing of uh, classical mechanics, if you want, of, of rationalists who made us believe that the world is not complex. Fortunately, it is. And this leads me to my very last slide, which is again a question. If, if, if this describes some of the issues we have, a question for this conference is this one. What education for mutual learning? Because complex systems, living systems, don't change because we want them to change. They change by learning something else in a new con context. So, what we have to do is basically to be involved in mutual learning. How education, formal or informal, can do that? I leave you with this question. Thank you. <laughs>